All right, I want to uh, welcome everyone to today's edition of the Polyploid webinar. Uh, today we have two great speakers. Uh, up first, we have uh, Dr. Sonia Garcia. Uh, Sonia earned her PhD in pharmacy in the botanical branch uh, at the University of Barcelona in 2007. And since late 2015, she's been a researcher uh, in the program of Ramon y Cajal at the Botanical Institute of Barcelona, uh, a center belonging to the Spanish Research Council. Uh, Sonia leads a small group focused on plant cytogenetics, in particular the evolution of ribosomal genes, or ribosomal RNA genes, and other repetitive DNA. She's also organized cytogenetic information mostly on plants and several online databases. And today she's going to tell us about two of those databases, uh, B-Chrome, a database with information on B-chromosomes in plants, animal and fungi, and Sex-Chrome, a new resource with data on plant sex chromosomes. She'll also give us some clues on the relationships between B chromosomes, sex chromosomes, and polyploidy. And with that, I'm going to let Sonia take over and give us her talk. Okay. Thanks, Mike, for your presentation. As, as you said, I'm going to talk, although the title might be perhaps a little bit misleading, but I'm going to, to present uh, mostly two databases, one based on B chromosomes and the other of, on sex chromosomes and the relationship with polyploidy. Uh, although I must say I'm not an expert either in B chromosomes nor sex chromosomes nor polyploidy, but I really like chromosomes <laughs> and, uh, and we enjoy making these, these databases to analyze uh, global data sets. So I hope you, you consider this and, and then I will proceed to make my presentation. So first of all, we will talk about B chromosomes. B chromosomes, um, you, you probably have heard of them. And they are um, co also called supernumerary or additional or selfish chromosomes. And they are mostly not necessary for, for the plant or for the organism to survive. Um, they are present in, in some, but not all individuals of a population. They may also be present in, in different, in one tissue of the, in certain tissues and not present in other tissues, or even in the same tissue, some cells may have B chromosomes or may not. Actually, it depends on the B chromosome and on the species, how they behave. B chromosomes fail to recombine during meiosis and they have a non-Mendelian inheritance. They are usually smaller than, than A chromosomes. You can see here in these dear B chromosomes, in the, these dear uh, chromosomes, these little uh, balls here, DNA balls, are these B chromosomes, or in this uh, plant, the Calda palustris, and here you have the B chromosome, or even in this other plant here, these other B chromosomes. However, they may be larger. For example, in this sphere, in this fish, you can see these several the different individuals of this fish have either no B chromosomes or one or two. And these B chromosomes are perhaps, well, this, as as big as the biggest uh, pair of chromosomes in the A chromosome set. They are mostly heterochromatic and non-coding, although they are exceptions. They may lack centromere, as probably these bees in deer, and they can vary also according to environmental conditions. Just a brief uh, outlook to the B chromosomes. What is the origin? Probably there are several origins. Um, I mean, this is polyphyletic. Um, B chromosomes are found in animal and plant kingdoms and fungi as well. Um, the most plausible explanation is that, of course, they are derived of the, from the A chromosomes and they may come from uh, after imbalance asymmetric translocation from small centric fragments. Um, they can be derived from centromeric regions. It has been found in some uh, rye, I think. And they can also be derived from sex chromosomes or they can be a byproduct of hybridization processes. What do B chromosomes do? Sometimes they are bad, sometimes they are good, and sometimes they do nothing. Um, for example, in these uh, fungus, they can carry re antibiotic resistance. Um, they may be useful for crop improvement and use kind like a plasmid, like a, way of carrying some good genes for, for the crops, for example. They can have selective environmental advantages in allium xenobrasum, for example. They, they, however, they have been related to lower vigor or impaired fertility in plants of, in this, uh, this poesy, Dactylis glomerata. And before I said that they mostly are heterochromatic, they don't carry information, but that's not completely true. Um, actually, ribosomal uh, RNA genes have been found in 
in certain uh, populations of Plantagolagopus or other genes from multigene families. So there is also an emerging field of research which is called B-omics, which is uh, related to the applications that B chromosomes can have uh, in, uh, in, in plants, in general in plants or in, well, I'm plant scientist, so <laughs> I tend to go to plants uh, quite a lot. Anyway, there, this, there is this B-omics field. So, because we were interested in big chromosomes, we organized the information about uh, big chromosomes uh, in plant, animal, and fungi, fungi uh, in the big chrome database. The, we released this database in 2017, although it collects data until July 2016, and it was based it was based on a previous database pre performed by Jones and Bieth in 2004, but this database was not, it was only based in an access file, which, which uh, contrary to its name, was very difficult to access. So we transformed the data and we updated because this data, uh, this uh, database contained papers until 1994. So, so we updated this information and now we are still working in the update of the next uh, release of this database. Uh, to gather more information. So which it is a very simple database. It contains information on chromosome number, ploidy level, and presence or number of B chromosomes, since many papers report um, presence of B, but they don't bother to, or because sometimes it's not that easy to count how many Bs are there, or so many, sometimes it's so, so variable that, that it's difficult to, to know how many, uh, if it's a stable number or not. So this data is complemented by data on genome size when available, or uh, data on chromosome numbers has been checked with uh, these three databases that, that I have listed here. So this is how the database look if we go quickly here. So this is the, the home page of the database. Uh, species are organized by a large group of organisms, and it's very simple. You just write the name that you want, and then it comes uh, the information um, which has been extracted for, for every publication. Good. So if you go back to the presentation, um, the database has information for, well, it's mostly a plant uh, B chromosome database, but uh, B chromosomes are most, more, more found in plants. Um, so it has uh, data for two, more than 2,000 plant species, 700 something animal species, and only 14 fungu, fungi. And uh, with this data, we have estimated that 3% of plant species with chromosome number, with known chromosome number, sorry, uh, may have bees. There are other estimates that put this cipher uh, around 15% of angiosperms in this case. So the database collects information, as I said, in ploidy levels. We report ploidy levels up to 22, and this is in plants. In animals, it's much uh, narrow range. Chromosome numbers are from four to 720. This belongs to a fern, but animals, it's between six and 150. And we, we as I said before, only 13% of the entries report the presence of B chromosome without saying how many, although the most common finding is one B chromosome. So in 25% in of entries, we have one B chromosome uh, detected. Um, B chromosome range uh, between one and 15. Indeed, 15 are quite a number of B chromosomes. The highest numbers of B chromosomes, we, we don't have a a statistical analysis for this because there were not enough data, but uh, we found that most plants uh, presenting vegetative reproduction or reproduction asexually have a lot of B chromosomes. So the highest B chromosomes are in plants. All these plants have, have kind of um, some possibility of asexual reproduction. So these, these are very ornamentals, well-known ornamentals. Okay, in animals, uh, the highest B chromosomes are for uh, this um, mouse, Apodemos peninsulae, or for this spider, okay? So what about the relationship between B chromosomes and polyploidy? As I said, it's not much explored, but with our data set, we found that there was a significant trend to higher number of Bs with higher polyploidy, and higher ploidy, sorry, and uh, higher chromosome numbers and a larger genome size. This here, I am showing results of three genera, 
for which we have a lot of uh, data uh, with species with different ploid levels and uh, abundance of B chromosomes. So for example, if you see, this is uh, genus Artemisia, uh, genus Festuca or uh, genus Allium. So in the left side, there is a column presenting all species and in the right side, species with bees. And here is, it is the, the legend. So only diploids are in, in blue, diploids and polyploids are in orange and oliploids are in, in gray. So you may see that the, the orange is the most uh, frequent found, most frequently found um, in uh, species with bees, which means that species that are present at different ploid levels, so they are somehow genomically, genomically dynamic, uh, are the ones that typically present more B chromosomes. So why I said that the chromosome, B chromosome research is not that, that uh, and polyploidy, sorry, that uh, explored? Well, this uh, is this first uh, diagram is a search um, in uh, two databases, Scopus or Web of Science, with the um, strategy topic or title title, abstract, and keywords, which means that uh, the word, uh, these words, B chromosome or supernumerary, these words, uh, have to be either in title, abstract, and keywords, and topic is the, the, um, the equivalent in Web of Science. So if you do this search, um, you find a lot of papers, um, but if you add polyploidy, um, the number of papers is quite uh, reduced. This is uh, all ages from 1950 something to, to present, okay? So, well, one thing, inter one interesting thing, which is a little bit uh, side to this, to this project is that when you find things in Scopus or in Web of Science, pre be prepared to find different, very different results. So, for example, um, Web of Science does not retrieve the same um, it, it finds it finds less results, probably is more specific, but also results that are different from the ones uh, found in Scopus. But just this is just for for your information. So in our uh, search, combined search, B chromosomes or similar words to B chromosomes, and um, and polyploidy, our uh, our um, search this now this is results only for Scopus shows that plants. Uh, research in plants is the most uh, characteristic in this topic. Obviously, polyploidy is more common in plants than in animals, so this explains it. And here we show the, the um, different years, how the topic has uh, claimed the interest of researchers. So it seems that lately, well, it's not, not much interested, but in the last uh, five years, uh, there was an um, uplift of this, of this uh, topic research. So this is uh, everything regarding B chromosomes and polyploidy. We will briefly speak about plant sex chromosomes. In this case, this database is, well, database is only for plants. So what about plant sex chromosomes? You well know, it is well known that most plant species are hermaphrodite, contrary to animals actually, and only 6% of angiosperms indeed are dioecious. This uh, determination of sex is mostly under control of nuclear genes, which are usually located or mostly located in sex chromosomes. And only a few dioecious species have chromosomes that are um, easily distinguishable by looking at the microscope and seeing really usually big X chromosome, small Y chromosome. Um, but many more species are dioecious, but the chromosomes are homomorphic. Sex chromosomes are homomorphic, which means that they are the same, more or less same size. Dioecy as uh, B chromosomes have multiple origins. Actually, it's, it's, uh, it's thought that there are more than 1,000 independent transitions in plants from hermaphrodite ancestors. The, the, the ancestral condition is hermaphroditism. And, um, the emergence of sex chromosomes is usually from a pair of autosomes in which, in which there is an initial partial lack of recombination, like, like here. So there is a, a mutation that determines uh, sex, that may determine sex, and this mutation restricts recombination within both chromosomes. So this uh, region is perhaps um, free to accumulate repeats or mutate, uh, or, mm, so over the time it can mutate, 
it can increase in size and later it can by inversions translocations because it's it's free of recombination so can it can decrease in size and, and eventually in some species can y chromosome can can disappear this is just a model of emergence of sex chromosomes so there are several kinds of uh, plant sex chromosome the most typical one is the male heterochromatic model, uh, which females are homogametic, but there are, well, I, I will go fast through this. And then there is the female heterochromatic, which is found in other systems, or the UV system, which is found in, in some um, algae or some bryophytes. Okay, there are other models of sex determination, like cytoplasmic male sterility, um, which is encoded by mitochondria in some species, or the environmental control of sex expression, like in, in well, in some animals, it's also, it also happens. So here there is a plate that we put in our paper presenting the database, showing the um, chromosome, sex chromosome of Grumex or Silini. So Silini, actually, it's a very interesting model for the study of sex determination. Um, um, because in a, in a single genus, we find hermaphrodites, we find dio ratios, but we find X, Y, and we, we find Z, W, and we also find uh, this, in this case, the island this 2X and 2Y uh, system. So just to mention this. So now we move to the sex chromosome database. This database uh, has uh, information coming from these 431 sources, 65 families, 84 genera, and 178 species, and it includes all this kind of information that it's easily available. We try to digest this information to make it more um, uh, accept easily to understand to the even non non expert uh, public uh, on on these sex determination things. So also the database has a let what we call individual databases. I, I'm not entering because I see that I'm a little bit uh, uh, behind time. But uh, there are individual databases for these, uh, let's say, model organisms in plant sex chromosome research that, that uh, represent ZW, XY, X, X uh, autosome, et cetera. And we have information for sex linked genes, sex bias gene, specific loci or sequence, tandem repeat sequences, transposable elements, et, et cetera. Okay. So plant sex chromosomes and polyploidy. Well, the relationship as I said, this, this is a, prob a summary of a paper that I have found, which was very good and explains uh, how um, polyploidy and sex chromosome and or sex determination can be linked. Okay, so these are the some of the most common sex determination systems, which are maybe classified in gender dimorphism or gender monomorphism. Here is a um, I will not go through this because it's a little bit complicated to explain. But how, uh, from a hermaphrodite ancestor, it it, go, it goes through several intermediates and it, it's finishing in, in ratios. And while these authors found that plant genera are significantly more likely to contain gender dimorphic, so ratios, let's say, would be the most common, polyploid than gender dimorphic diploid species. So, so dimorphism would be more common in polyploid uh, systems. For example, in Fragaria, which is a, a model system for plant sex chromosome research, at the diploid level, in, in some clades of the, the tree of Fragaria, at the diploid level, 15 out of 17 are hermaphrodites. Uh, what, uh, hermaphrodites are diploid, sorry. Whereas of the gender dimorphic, mostly dioecious, but there is some trioecious or gynodioecious uh, species, are uh, polyploid. Okay, so here there are explain briefly brief explanation of how uh, we can well simultaneous or sequential pathways uh, that go uh, from one system to the other in different ploidy levels. Um, these are some examples, not uh, exhaustive. Okay, but uh, for example, from how can we go from a diploid gender monomorphic, so mostly hermaphrodite, hermaphrodite, to a polyploid gender dimorphic, so mostly dioecious. So a uh, whole genome duplication somehow causes male or female sterility, which causes, uh, which uh, can be caused by all these uh, factors written here, structural rearrangements, insertions, duplications, etc., which somehow can reduce recombination 
and this is the let's say the um, the um, matter for for the sex chromosome evolution so from in the moment that you have a reduced recombination uh, sex chromosome uh, sex determinant ratio can happen and then uh, sex chromosomes can be formed and the other way around from a diploid dimorphic to a polyploid monomorphic it's less common although it's it's found and in this case whole genome duplication can cause breakdown of nuclear sex determination or duplication of sex chromosome which reinstores uh, uh, both male and female fertility and then it can have become hermaphrodite again whole chromosome loss uh, and the best example of the effect of genome duplication in gender is found in moses so in moses you know that the gametophyte male or female are haploid uh, so the only possibility to have hermaphrodite is possible in in polyploids where when gametophytes are diploid okay uh, it's very fast to be so these are some examples of transition from diploid gender monomorphism let's say mostly hermaphrodism to polyploid gender dimorphism so these are in this uh, some most genera from families Cactaceae or Meliantaceae, well, all these families listed here are, uh, this system is found, this, this um, transition is found. Um, the transition from diploid gender dimorphism to polyploid gender monomorphism exclusively is, is less common. It's found in this plant, in Isotoma. Okay. And in all these systems, there are, they have, uh, there have been found transitions uh, from, from one system to the other in different uh, ploidy levels. So, for example, uh, Mercurialis, which is a good model for, for this, um, the IOHs can be diploid or hermaphrodite, and uh, polyploids uh, can, can be androdioatios, um, dioatios, or even hermaphrodite. So, it's mm, mm, lots of things going on between the relationship in um, between uh, uh, sex determination, sex chromosomes, and polyploidy. So this is all I wanted to, to, to explain. Uh, I thank all these people that have worked in the compilation of the databases or in, in other projects, uh, related projects. And also I want to thank to Mike and the Barker Lab for, for, for organizing these webinars, which are great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, well, thank you, Sonia, for a wonderful talk. Um, if folks want to uh, go ahead and ask any questions, um, feel free to enter those in the chat window, and then we'll do what we've done in the, the past couple of, uh, of sessions here and have everybody uh, turn on their camera and ask, ask the question uh, in person. Um, but go ahead and bring, fire those in. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alish. <laughs> I'm. Mm. All right. Well, um, I think everything was clear. <laughs> everything, it was very. I I really enjoyed it. I'm. Uh, I am sort of curious too about. Uh, I guess I'll I'll go ahead and ask a, a real quick question. Um, when you, uh, uh, look at the prevalence of B chromosomes in, in, in the, in plant genomes, do you see a strong, um, do you see any evidence of a sort of a strong phylogenetic pattern in those data yet? Uh, or has it not been analyzed on that axis to see, are there some families yeah. or genera yeah. where it's much more common? No, we, we, we have not analyzed in, in that, in that, uh, because the data it was was very sparse yeah and, that's what i wonder yeah yeah and we did not analyze this uh, but i don't think there is a phylogenetic pattern uh, but but this it's mostly a feeling well obviously it, it has uh, appeared several times independently and and probably looking at the different types of b chromosomes there are very different uh, origins like you see such in that fish uh, uh, big uh, big chromosome with a big centromere, and then in deer, a very small, uh, uh, like uh, eccentric fragments, probably. Uh, so, right. yeah, it, it may 
I, I am, we, I mean, it's a, it's a good point. Actually, we, we are asked to do phylogenetic uh, analysis in, in this kind of, uh, well, we are asked and we, we do it because it makes sense, of course. But data are, um, yeah, very much spread and very uneven, I would say. I don't know, maybe in some group. Yeah. But yeah, no, I don't think uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, also feel like, I also feel like as someone who I've, you know, when we did the, that Wood et al. paper back in 2009 on the frequency of polyploidy and then the Thai in his lab put a lot of those counts that we had collected manually into this data, the chromosome count database. It's amazing, you know, I also wonder how many B chromosomes are missed because going through the, all the old cytological literature, you sometimes see them mentioned, but um, I'm yeah. curious, I, I kind of wonder how much of the, the pattern we see may be structured by the particular authors who have, who have um, you know, people that manage to note them and other cytologists may have just ignored them. Uh, yes. Those old counts. Yeah. Um, yeah, the thing is that B chromosomes are so, I would say, um, unpredictable. I, I, Totally. For example, in, in during my PhD, I, I start actually one of the features of the beginning was mine because I was studying some uh, Artemisia related plants, uh, which is compositive. And at some point, I really, I was looking at different seeds and I found B chromosomes in one seed of the same chap um, capitulum. Okay. But no, no, not in all of them. And even yeah. in the same so it's it's kind of anarch anarchic, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say, I don't know. M maybe in some other organisms, for example, I have seen rye uh, <laughs> at, uh, has a kind of constant uh, B chromosome, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. It it it, it yeah. Well, yeah, I see maybe some of them are overlooked, probably. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here um, from Ben Gerstner. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. So uh, long term, uh, yeah, long term plan for maintaining these databases. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is always the, the, the question that also reviewers uh, in the papers like to do. Yeah, well, at present, we in our group, we manage like five or I think five databases about cytogenetic data. So we started in 2010, 11. At, from now, we, we, we are, um, we managed to, to update them like for every four, five years or so. We have a, a database on genome size in Esteraci because our our research research group works a lot in Esteraci. So we wanted to make a specific database uh, on this. So this one has been updated th two or three times already. But so plan, yeah, as long as there are resources, uh, we, we, we try to maintain it. But yeah, we, we can, yeah. We, we try and we are, have been doing for all, all those that we can. And actually this, the Bikram database is now being updated. Um, probably next year we, we will release the, the, first, the, the next update. Bikram, uh, the Sexcrom database has just been released. So we don't plan uh, an update very soon. But all yeah, right. this is the thing. So uh, I'm going to see. You've what got a couple more there. Yeah. Yeah, long-term evolutionary outcomes for B chromosomes. Extinction, recombination back into a genome, other, are these known? Well, as I said, the B chromosomes have very different origins and different types. So, so it depends. Maybe if, if it, at some point it carries, well, I'm going to say some evolutionary obvious thing, but uh, if it carries some advantage to the individual, uh, it may be maintained, but uh, they, it is said, I, I, I said that I'm not a super expert in B chromosome, but they are, they have some kind of drive. There's a way of evolution called drive. So sometimes they, 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 rep, they either persist or just disappear. Well, and back to extinction recombination. Yeah, everything is possible in B chromosomes actually. This is what, what I would say. And what else? Uh, the bias for because they have transposons. Okay, transposons in B chromosomes or sex chromosomes. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, there has been there are certain B chromosomes that are rich in sex chromosomes. Sorry, what I'm saying. They, they are rich in transposons um, that are that are somehow they they amplify in these B chromosomes. Um, 
for example, in Silene, I think the the X Y chromosome is enriched in a particular type of transposon. Which are, this is not my research either. This is what I have I have seen. But but yeah, there, there is um, some actually some B chromosomes can uh, evolve themselves and get bigger by uh, accumulation of transposon or repeats that that enhance the B chromosome. Yeah. Are there plans for even? Ah, for more databases, <laughs> um, not not yet. No, I I don't think so at present. I, I I've got enough uh, with these five databases or so. All right. Well, that'll um, keep you that'll keep you busy hi, too. Hello. hello. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, I think it, we'll switch over now to Joel. If there are any other questions hey. for Sonia, we'll. Uh, as always, be uh, around after the the, the next talk uh, to bring those questions with you, or if you think of them uh, in the meantime. Um, and I'll let Joel go ahead. And but I thank Sonia for a wonderful talk. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks. And uh, I think we heard a couple of those fireworks too. That was pretty good. Uh, we'll let Joel uh, take over here. All right. There we go. Okay, well, and, and for the second half of today's talk, we have uh, Dr. Joel Sharbro. Uh, Joel is an evolutionary biologist who studies the coevolution of genomes uh, and their emergent cellular and organismal phenotypes. Um, particularly today, he's going to tell us about work on the cytonuclear dimension of allopolyploidy, uh, but he's also interested in the, the context of eukaryotic energy production. Um, Joel is originally from Lake Tahoe, but has uh, moved to the Midwest to attend the University of Notre Dame for his undergraduate uh, degree and then moved on a little bit, just a little west of there to Iowa City, uh, Iowa, where he pursued his PhD at the University of Iowa uh, with Dr. Uh, Maria Neyman, uh, studying the evolutionary maintenance of sexual reproduction. Uh, after his PhD, uh, Joel uh, went to Fort Collins and worked as a postdoc with Dr. Dan Sloan, studying the cytonuclear interaction of allopolyploids, uh, which he's going to tell us about today. And I think that uh, coming up in January of this year, uh, Joel will be a new assistant professor at New Mexico Tech. So if you're interested in studying these questions, I think Joel will be looking to build a lab uh, in the in the coming uh, coming years, uh, COVID-19 uh, permitting, of course, uh, these days. But um, with all of that, I'm going to let Joel tell us all about his work on the cytonuclear dimension of allopolyploidy. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for um, uh, organizing all this stuff. Wonderful talk, Sonia. That was really interesting. Um, just ahead of time, uh, my internet's pretty unstable, so if... I drop out for some reason. I'll post these slides up on uh, my GitHub uh, and post a link to it on Twitter so you can review them at your leisure. Um, but yeah, so thank you for having me today and thanks for joining. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the cytonuclear dimension of allopolyploid. So many organisms are polyploids and here I'm just showing a few of my favorites that I've worked on. Um, and Notably, they're not just plants. There's lots of uh, animals and fungi that are also polyploid. Um, and not only are there lots of current polyploids, but whole genome duplication uh, and uh, polyploidy and the, the consequences of polyploidy uh, have been experienced by most eukaryotic lineages. So uh, when we see this whole genome duplication going from diploid to polyploid, tetraploid in this case, uh, many lineages have this uh, this type of mutation in their evolutionary history. Um, and the Barker Lab, and in particular Zhang Li, have described this thoroughly in a bunch of different lineages. Here I'm showing a really nice figure from uh, their 2018 paper uh, of hexapods. Hey, and all hey, of the little... Just not to interrupt you, but I don't, no. I don't think we're seeing the, uh, the slides on our end, actually. It's sort of just sitting You're there. On... Just to let okay. you know. Oh, there you go. Oh, that worked for... A second. Yeah, I'm sorry. My screens are very um, problematic today. Um, I just saw a message from a couple other people too, so letting me okay, know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, is this not is this not working? Maybe I need to turn on presenter view. I think that might um, be the way to go. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for interrupting. I can't actually see you, Mike. So oh, yeah. if uh, I, at some point you'll have to tell me when the time is uh, is up. Okay. Okay, this isn't working very well. It seems it worked for a second there, and then it pops back. Yeah, when I when I hit escape, it's. Um... Hmm. 
any ideas on? Well, the other way to do it might be just to, help this? to make it uh, sort of as big as you can on the screen and just scroll through those those slides if that works. Yeah, I can try. There are some animations, oh, so no. I'll have to dynamically do it. Uh, never again am I doing animations. Um, I think we've all learned that lesson once or twice. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see if this works. Is that working or no, that's not working. It says my screen sharing is paused anytime I go into this huh. uh, sc screen. Okay, so I will just have to animate on the fly and hope you guys can um, see it okay. Sorry about this. No worries. Okay. But you can see this okay, correct? You can see the, uh, the yes. PowerPoint. Okay, and you can still see it? Yep. Okay. Okay, so, um, so yes, many eukaryotes have whole genome duplications. Really nice uh, paper by Zhongli and colleagues showing this in the hexapods. Um, and importantly, um, the polyploidy is one of the most profound mutations that uh, an organism or a population can experience. Uh, the effects of polyploidy have been uh, documented in things like speciation, adaptation, um, shifts in reproductive mode or mating system uh, and inter that we talked about last week, actually, or two weeks ago, um, intergenomic recombination and gene conversion between genome copies, silencing and loss of duplicated genes, mobilization of TEs, um, as we just served, B chromosomes, um, alteration of epigenetic marks, um, massive genome-wide transcriptional rewiring, and it's also expected to uh, perturb cytonuclear interactions. And so if you think about eukaryotic cells, they, they have other genomes besides the nuclear genome, uh, namely uh, mitochondrial genomes, and in the case of uh, plants, uh, chloroplast genomes as well. And there's two primary ways that I'm going to talk about today in which polyploidy should screw up these interactions between the nuclear genome and the, and the cytoplasmic genomes. The first is altered cytonuclear stoichiometry, in which the whole nuclear genome is instantly doubled, and the uh, organelle genomes have to deal with a cell in, in which that's the case. Um, and the second is that cytonuclear incompatibilities can result from hybridization. Okay, so um, this is essential, right, because these organelle genomes uh, produce the vast majority of cellular energy um, and uh, here I'm showing an example of mitochondria, what goes on there. And so we see that uh, inside the mitochondrial uh, reticulum, there are uh, complexes embedded inside of it that control ATP production. Those complexes uh, in, uh, are often encoded by two separate genomes. So here I'm showing um, the five complexes of, of can canonical oxpose with nuclear encoded subunits uh, denoted in blue and mitochondrial encoded subunits denoted in red. And you can see really intimate physical interactions between nuclear encoded subunits and mitochondrial encoded subunits, such that uh, coevolution between these genomes is essential to maintain proper function. Okay, so um, in, let's talk about how altered cytonuclear stoichiometry can affect this. So if we imagine a uh, diploid cell that's got its complement of chloroplast and mitochondria that undergoes a whole genome duplication, there's two primary things that, that happen. Number one is that polyploids have twice as many genes present in their nuclear genome, and they also have larger cells. So together, these two uh, phenomena impose constraints on the cell. Um, and, and as such, it alters the genome copy number of uh, the nuclear versus the organelle genomes. So we expect that this should re require compensation. Um, and in particular, there's a, it, compensation can occur at many different levels. So on the left, I'm showing a diploid, and on the right, I'm showing a polyploid. Um, and we could imagine compensation for this doubled nuclear genome in uh, terms of more organelles in a polyploid cell. Maybe those organelles are larger. Uh, inside of those organelles, those organelles may encode, may have more 
uh, genome copies per organelle. Um, and uh, each of those genome copies can be expressed at higher levels to compensate. On the nuclear side, you could also imagine uh, transcriptional silencing such that the nuclear genome expresses fewer transcripts per genome copy um, to allow for dynamic regulation of this cytonuclear stoichiometry. So these have all been hypothesized, but not a lot of work has been done to follow up on them. Um, so we're interested in doing this uh, in a collaboration with the Wendell Lab at, at Iowa State. Um, and we're interested in studying all of these uh, levels of regulation by which cytonuclear stoichiometry can be affected in diploids versus polyploids. Uh, but today I'm just going to talk about organelle genome copy number. Okay, so uh, polyploid wheat is awesome. I love wheat. It's so such a cool plant. Um, and it's got this really unique uh, evolutionary history of multiple whole genome duplications. Namely, um, the Triticum or the ancestor of Triticum urartu and ancestor of Aegilops speltoides hybridized uh, roughly 500,000 to a million years ago to produce tetraploid wheat, and that uh, has been since domesticated into pasta wheat. Um, and then, uh, it, presumably, in some farmer's field like 10,000 years ago, pasta wheat hybridized with um, this lineage Aegilops tauchii, uh, giving it uh, turn going from uh, tetraploid into an allohexaploid, such that it's got uh, three different genomes present in it. And, and this is a really great system for evaluating uh, cytonuclear stoichiometry because you have multiple different ploidy levels, and those ploidy levels have uh, different levels of time at which they've been uh, present at either tetraploid or hexaploid. So we can evaluate the short and long-term consequences of uh, this genome doubling for cytonuclear stoichiometry. Okay, so to do this, uh, to evaluate organelle genome copy numbers per cell, we use uh, a technique called uh, droplet digital P PCR or DDPCR. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, it's a really fantastic and precise way to estimate copy number in a given sample. Um, and I'll briefly describe how it works. Essentially, it's uh, a conventional PCR emulsified into 20,000 individual droplets. And so uh, it's digital because if a droplet got the uh, target of interest, then it will fluoresce after undergoing amplification. If it didn't get the target gene of interest, then it will not fluoresce. And so you get this binary signal of either fluorescent or not fluorescent, allowing for really precise estimates of copy number inside an individual sample. So we did this for uh, mitochondrial, uh, chloroplast, uh, and nuclear genomes in uh, diploid, allotetraploid, and allohexaploid wheat. Uh, our nuclear primers were used to, uh, they were verified to single copy genes, and we used them as our per cell copy number. So the number of uh, nuclear copies, that's our de uh, denominator for the number of cells present in our sample. And then we uh, compared mitochondrial and chloroplast genome copy number uh, in these various primers across ploidy levels. So briefly, let me just give you some predictions. So if, if there is no compensation for whole genome duplication, uh, then we expect similar numbers of organelle genomes per cell, and such that in diploid, tetraploid, and hexaploid lineages, we get similar numbers of organelle genomes. Um, these will obviously vary across mitochondria versus chloroplasts, where mitochondria tend to be in the hundreds per cell range and chloroplasts tend to be in the thousands per cell range, but we expect the same response across the organelles. So on the other hand, if there is compensation for a whole genome duplication, we expect a sort of linear or proportional increase in the number of organelle genome copies per cell, um, such that the polyploids should have more organelle genome copies than their diploid relatives. Um, okay, so uh, we did this in uh, four species, two diploid species, Aegilops speltoides, Triticum urartu, which are the parental diploid models, as well as uh, pasta wheat and bread wheat. Pasta wheat's the tetraploid, and uh, bread wheat is the hexaploid here. And what we can see is with uh, mitochondria in the top panel and chloroplast on the bottom panel, is that polyploids always have more organelle genome copies than uh, diploids. 
um, and we can see the same exact pattern. Oh, sorry, uh, here's some dynamic uh, animations. We see the same exact pattern across uh, all four of our different primers for both genomes. So in all these cases, in the mitochondria, polyploids have a higher number of organelle genomes per cell, and, uh, and same in the chloroplasts. Now, there's a slight difference here in mitochondria versus chloroplast in that there is no difference between being tetraploid or hexaploid um, if you're, uh, for, for the mitochondrial genomes. But there is a linear increase in uh, copy number for uh, the chloroplast genomes. Um, and so what we think this might reflect is genetic architecture underlying the compensation mechanism. So in this case, the hexaploid has only been around for 10,000 years or so. And so perhaps there hasn't been time enough to compensate at the, uh, on the mitochondrial genome side, but evidently there has been at the chloroplasts on the chloroplast genome. Okay, so... Um, uh, we, I just showed you some data on organelle genome copies, but recently uh, Jeremy Cote and colleagues uh, did this, published this really great study in Arabidopsis autopolyploids in which they described um, uh, transcription and uh, on the nuclear and on the organelle side uh, for a bunch of uh, Arab Arabidopsis lineages. And in particular, they've got, they've got some really great lineages that we've uh, requested seeds from and have gotten. Uh, and so we're planning a new experiment. And, and this next experiment will complement our wheat study with a, uh, a, a sort of diverse array of allo and auto polyploids um, and that are from natural and uh, induced polyploidy. So Arabidopsis suesica is a natural allo tetraploid um, uh, whose parents are Arabidopsis arenosa and Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, and then uh, there's natural accessions of Arabidopsis thaliana that are tetraploid. And uh, so, uh, a group in 2010 induced haploidy in this lineage to make it a diploid. So we have sort of the opposite direction of uh, both polyploidy going up and then return to diploidy going down in this Warshaw lineage of Arabidopsis. And then uh, Luca Komai and Adrian Reeder have done a really nice job generating a series of colchicine induced um, uh, auto tetraploid, auto polyploids in Columbia Zero. And so we have diploid, tetraploid, and octoploids of those, of that lineage. So we're going to use all of these different lineages to assay copy number and see whether it's immediate or an evolved response to uh, whole genome duplication. Okay, so that sort of concludes this part of the talk where we see elevated organelle genome copy number in polyploids, indicating that there is compensation at the genomic level for uh, the whole genome duplications. And we're evaluating whether this is an evolved versus immediate response in Arabidopsis. Okay, so second part of the talk is about incompatibilities. Of course, many polyploids are hybrids. They're allopolyploids, wherein you get a hybridization event between species A in purple and species B in green such that half of its resulting nuclear genome is green, is, uh, green and half of, its re uh, half of the, re the remaining half is purple uh, from species B and A respectively. Uh, but the organelle genomes come specifically from the maternal lineage in, in most cases. Cucumbers are a notable exception, um, but for simplicity, we can just say that the organelle genomes are coming from the maternal lineage such that they may be mismatched with the green paternal nuclear subgenome. And so this potential mismatch uh, provides for a possibility wherein uh, uh, incompatibilities between the uh, organelle genomes and the nuclear uh, paternally derived subgenome are incompatible and result in differential evolution across nuclear subgenome copies. Um, all right, some more dynamic animation. Okay, so we expect this process to uh, play out over uh, evolutionary time with different uh, degrees uh, or with different effects at different time periods. So for example, early on after polyploid uh, polyploidization, we expect there to be biased gene expression favoring the maternal allele, but over time this can result in 
accelerated rate of uh, protein sequence evolution in the paternal homeolog, and eventually biased gene retention such that you get only uh, the maternal allele being retained in older polyploids. Okay, so uh, we're studying this in um, a, sorry, some more dynamic animation. We're studying this in a, um, a diverse array of polyploids. I'm going to show you data from three polyploids today, quinoa, cotton, and wheat, but we're also looking at all of these other species, coffee, tobacco, uh, brachypodium, etc. And all of them share this particular phylogenetic structure uh, in which um, you have a maternal and paternal diploids that we have genomes for, and then a hybrid polyploid that has a good uh, phased out genome, and a reasonably close outgroup diploid as well. Um, and basically what we do is we estimate uh, branch-specific DNDS in all of these lineages. Um, and I can show you the sort of time scale on which uh, our polyploids exist. Here on the uh, x-axis is uh, the divergent, the time since polyploidy in DS time. And then on the y-axis is the amount of amino acid divergence between protein sequences. And so we can see with these three species, we've got a range of divergence times and, and a, range, a range of amount of divergence of the, of the two subgenomes and of, of time since polyploidy. Okay, so in order to do this, we need to partition our genes uh, into uh, uh, genes that are not targeted to the organelles, genes that are targeted to the organelles, uh, but don't interact, and all of the genes that do interact with the uh, chloroplast and mitochondrial encoded protein subunits. Um, and so we built this tool called Cimera, um, and, and essentially it's based in Arabidopsis, and it shows all of the individual interactions as well as the uh, targeting predictions for every gene, gene in the Arabidopsis genome. Um, Subsequently, I've built a pipeline that's available at this uh, GitHub address right here um, uh, to be able to port these uh, Cimera gene categories over from a Arabidopsis into other species. So if you're interested in doing that for your species of interest, please contact me or go ahead and run the pipe on your own. You're free, you'll feel free to run it. Um, but if you need help with it, I'm happy to run it for you as well. Uh, the output of this Cimera database is basically that uh, for every genome that we put in, we get targeting and interaction information for all of the genes in every genome. Um, of course, the distance from Arabidopsis plays a role here. So the closer related the species is to Arabidopsis, the better these interaction and targeting prediction uh, are, are going to be. Um, but it still fair, works fairly well into monocots, as, as I can show you with wheat. Um, I'm not going to show too much of the data here today, though, but please ask questions about it later. Um, okay, so we take these uh, genes that are targeted and interact with the organelle gene uh, products, um, and uh, we evaluate whether mismatches between the paternal subgenome and the cytoplasmic genomes uh, give rise to cytonuclear incompatibilities. And so we expect two evolutionary processes to be the case. One is that there could be relaxed selection in the paternal copy as it begins to get pseudogenized, or it gets fixed, in which case both uh, of those events have the same evolutionary signature, and that is accelerated rates of protein sequence evolutions in the, pro in the paternal versus the maternal copy of genes that are targeted to the organelle, uh, to the to the mitochondria and plastids. Okay, so um, we've done this in all, all of our lineages by building these uh, so-called quintets for a bunch of for all of the genes in uh, in the genome. And I'm not going to tell you how we built these quintets, but it, it's a um, combination of phylogenetic and syntenic information that Justin Conover was uh, instrumental in, in, in developing. And if you're interested in a wonderful postdoc, I think he'll be defending his PhD soon if Jonathan lets him go. Uh, but he's just wonderful and he developed this pipeline to, uh, to identify these quintets. And so we can take these quintets and look at branch-specific evolution 
in the maternal lineage or the maternal subgenome versus the uh, paternal subgenome. Uh, the maternal sub um, the maternal lineage is purple here, and the paternal lineage is green here. And we're just going to directly compare rates of evolution in these two lineages uh, leading to the separate subgenomes. Okay, so we have a prediction then. So if, uh, if there are incompatibilities between the cytoplasmic genomes and the paternal subgenome, then we should expect faster uh, rates of evolution in the paternal subgenome. Uh, and, and that will scale with the intimacy of interaction. So for genes that are not targeted to the organelles, we expect no difference between maternal and paternal. But for genes that are uh, you know, involved in oxfos or directly involved in enzyme complexes, we expect those to be the, the height of those uh, incompatibilities. Okay, so let's look at some data. And um, first I wanna show you the uh, genes that are not targeted to the organelles. And uh, this red line here indicates equal rates of evolution across the subgenomes. Um, and what you can see is that, or hopefully you can see, is that in every species we have sort of uh, biases in the rates of subgenome evolution, even in these genes that are not targeted to the organelles. Those don't really have any bearing on the ancestors. So in the case of quinoa, genes that are uh, not targeted to the organelles evolve faster in the paternal subgenome than they do in the maternal subgenome. The opposite is true of cotton. Um, and then in wheat, the paternal subgenome evolves faster uh, genome-wide as well. So if we look at our, the rest of our segregated gene categories or partition gene categories, that bias gets reflected throughout such that all of the genes that are present in quinoa are all evolving faster in the paternal subgenome than the maternal subgenome. Uh, and the same story with cotton and wheat, in that whatever's going on between the subgenomes, that is a major effect of biased evolution in one subgenome versus the other that we need to account for. Okay, so um, if we want to actually look at the genes that are targeted to the organelles and the, the cytonuclear effects of that, we need to correct for the overall genomic bias. And so we've done that. And uh, here I'm showing uh, on the uh, x-axis is this normalized uh, DNDS ratio where paternal, uh, high paternal rate of evolution is on to the right and high, and high maternal rate of maternal evolution is to the left. Um, and so um, with the intimacy of the interaction going up as we go, uh, we have uh, on the bottom row is genes that are organelle targeted but not interacting. And the middle row is genes that are organelle targeted and interact with something in the organelle. And the third row is organelle targeted uh, and, and are involved in an enzyme complex. And so this is true for organelle targeted genes, mitochondrial targeted genes, plastid targeted genes, same structure. What we see is that by and large, the correction gets rid of lots of the bias in quinoa, suggesting that it's not really experiencing lots of uh, cytonuclear incompatibilities. Um, and uh, a little bit in them that, that after you correct for genome-wide effects, there is some small amount of maternal acceleration in cotton. And then in wheat, we see actually a significant effect in mitochondrial enzyme complexes here circled where the paternal subgenome is uh, accelerating uh, relative to the maternal subgenome. And so what, it, because this is a ratio of DNDS values or omega values, uh, it could be caused by a paternal acceleration or a maternal uh, re reduction in rate. And it could also be caused by changes in the mutation rate or changes in the amino acid rate. So uh, I've zoomed in on this and it turns out it's present in in oxfos, which is sort of our um, uh, category that we would expect, we would most expect it to be in the mitochondria. And if you look at the DS tree on the right, these are this is an estimate of the mutation rate. We don't see that the effect of this relationship is is a result of DS. Rather, it's a result of DN. That is, the rate of protein sequence evolution is ch changing in the paternal lineage, but not really in the maternal lineage. So this appears to be a potential case for a mitonuclear incompatibility in the oxfos genes of, of wheat. And I've traced this down 
back to uh, complexes three and five, and I'm still looking at the individual amino acid residues. But I think we, what we've got here is a bona fide uh, incompatibility between the cytoplasmic genomes and the paternal subgenome. Okay, but in cotton and quinoa, we didn't really see that. And um, so just for, to end, I wanna go towards an older uh, temporal signature, and that is biased gene retention, such that genes that are, uh, we expected that over time that maternally, the maternal genes will be preferentially retained if they're involved in intimate interactions. Um, and, and that's exactly what we see in cotton and quinoa. So uh, here I'm showing uh, just the overall retention rates. And you can see that in the non-targeted genes that there's, you know, sort of haphazard or random uh, differences across subgenomes. Um, and then, but so once we correct for those, uh, uh, those overall genome-wide rates of gene retention, we can see that in cotton, especially, there's a huge retention of maternal genes compared to paternal genes. Um, and uh, th it's mostly the case in quinoa, especially in the mitochondria as well. Wheat is a little bit weird in the preferential retention of paternal transcripts, but I think that this is a little weird because uh, the, the maternal gene, genome that we used for wheat is a, is a transcriptome and it's not very helpful. So I, I, wouldn't, I would take these wheat results with a huge grain of salt. Okay, so with that, I'd just like to conclude. So evolutionary rates vary dramatically across subgenomes, as do gene retention. Uh, we have evidence for mitonuclear incompatibilities in polyploid wheat. And then it looks like retention of organelle targeted genes might be maternally biased in older polyploids. So with that, I'd just like to thank uh, Mike for hosting and for all of you for your attention, uh, as well as uh, National Science Foundation for funding. Uh, my really great collaborators from the Wendell Lab, especially Justin, who's done a lot of the heavy lifting on the bioinformatics side. Um, my postdoctoral advisor, Dan Sloan, um, and then both, uh, both Colorado State and Iowa State for doing a great job administering this award. And then, yeah, it, I am starting at New Mexico Tech in January. So if you have masters or, or undergraduates who are interested in doing a master's um, at, uh, or PhD, I'm, I'm looking for students to work on this plant stuff. Uh, finally, I neglected to mention Matt Jorphy, who's uh, just a fantastic uh, collaborator. He started as an undergrad in the Sloan Lab and has now moved on to our research tech, and he's looking for PhD positions now. Unfortunately, not in polyploidy, which I was very sad about, but he's done a great job with this DDPCR data, and you can, I think, uh, see uh, the results of that very soon. We're hoping to get that out, but Matt's done a really good job. So um, sadly, we can't woo him back to polyploidy though. But with that, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know I skipped over a bunch of stuff. So if you have any questions on details, I'd, I'd love to talk about it more. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Joel, for a wonderful talk. Uh, and I think that we all got through the, the, the little technical difficulties there without any trouble. I don't think it diminished in anything in any way there. Um, as usual, let folks uh, post their questions here, um, and uh, and we can also go ahead and turn on the uh, uh, your your video and audio to ask those questions uh, uh, as we go through the list. I'll give it a couple seconds before I jump in with one of my own. So <laughs> I try not to be the first person to ask a question. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to jump in with a question. How's that? Well, sure, please typing do. in. Uh, well, here we go. Andrea, there you go. I'll let her okay. ask there. Andrea, um, can you measure transcription rates in the organelles? Do they go up to compensate? This is such a great question. I, this is what we're, we really want to do, um, and it's hard. So Jeremy Cote and Jeff Doyle have done a little bit of this um, already in Arabidopsis, um, but it's hard to get transcript rates in the organelles, mainly because the transcripts are not polyadenylated in the same way. So polyadenylation in the organelles means a different thing for, for stability, mRNA stability. So a lot of our RNA kits are polyase selected and it's really challenging to get organelle transcription rates. What you can do is do ribo zero depletion or ribosomal depletion 
Um, and that's what we're doing right now in um, Arabidopsis cotton, uh, quinoa, and peanuts. And um, yeah, so I think, I'm hoping from that data, we can get really nice bona fide expression data from the organelles. It'd be really nice to know which side of the equation is it on. Is it the organelle that's uh, it boosting up expression or is it the, um, the nuclear that's dropping down expression? And we, uh, at least for Arabidopsis, we're gonna have paired um, genome copy number data with our expression data. So we have it from the same plants where we can say, this is uh, um, the effect of genome copy compensation, and this is the effect of organelle transcription, and this is the effect of nuclear transcription. So that, yeah, partitioning those out is the goal. Good question. Um, let's see. Uh, Maloon. From Maloon uh, says, from the DN rate differences perspective, could you elaborate on the relationship between rate and cytonuclear incompatibility? Yeah, so this, I, I went really fast through this, sorry. Um, but I think um, there's a really great example in Nicotiana. So uh, tobacco is uh, allo tetraploid, um, and it's got a great deal of divergence between the subgenomes. So tomentosiformis, the diploid, and sylvestris are the most closely related diploids to the subgenomes. And they're really divergent within Nicotiana. Um, but if you look at, for example, CLIP, which is an essential gene in the chloroplast genome, there are no amino acid differences in CLIP uh, across those two diploid species and in the, in the uh, tetraploid. So we don't expect there to be any incompatibilities as a result, right? If, if there's no amino acid differences, then the nuclear encoded copies are equally well paired. What might go into preferential retention or biased evolution then, if they are equally well paired, is differences in effective population size, differences in TEs that might affect uh, um, evolution on one subgenome versus the other, differences in expression. All of those things can play a role in the biased retention. So sort of accounting for both sides, uh, both sides of that requires us to uh, segregate our likely incompatibilities into genes that have high divergence at, uh, in the amino acid sequence from the genes that don't really have any differences at all. Those vary tremendously across the genome. And, uh, and so, yeah, we, we need, we're gonna try and find out if, if we look at those genes that have high levels of divergence, do they also have, are they the players in incompatibilities? Great question. Okay. Mike, did you have a question? Well, it was along those similar lines. Uh, you, you sort of hit it there, uh, but I, I guess I can ask a more narrow version of it, which is um, when you see this putative in, uh, incompatibility that you're detecting in the wheat, do you think that's just simply a, a function of the higher amount of divergence between those parental, those putative parental genomes and the other allopolyploids? Uh, it seems like that might be the case to me, but I'm curious what your take is on all of that. Yeah, I think... Um... It, I, I think so. I think it's. I think it's a function of divergence. Um, it's really challenging in wheat to go. I, this is unbelievable to me. But we don't have a maternal genome for. We don't have a genome for Agelops peltoides. I, I really want to do it. I'm applying for money to do it. Or if anybody has already got money to do it, I'm happy to help for free. Whatever. We need a maternal genome for wheat, and so it's really hard to assess that. Yeah. Um, at least on the organelle side, we can do mitochondrial. Uh, comparisons and, and uh, look for incompatibilities there. Um, and so I think that's our best hope at the moment is looking for uh, amino acid changes in the organelle genes uh, of, of our diploids and then going and targeting our analyses towards uh, those complexes. So that's, that's up on the docket for, for wheat for sure. All right. All right, any other final questions uh, from the audience today? All right, well, I would like to uh, thank everyone for uh, uh, joining us here and thank Joel and Sonia for two wonderful talks. Um, and uh, I wanna point out that this recording will be posted uh, pretty soon this afternoon, uh, along with all the other recordings from the previous talks um, up on the website and uh, on the YouTube channel. 
uh, uh, for the webinar. Uh, looking ahead to next, uh, the next webinar session, uh, we have uh, two more great talks on July 13th. Um, coming up, we have next, uh, we have Anne Curie, uh, uh, Neopolyploidy and Arabidopsis thion affects performance of the generalist insect herbivore Trichopulsia nai, uh, as well as Sylvia Castro, who will tell us about the role of multiple reproductive barriers, strong post-pollination interactions, govern cytotype isolation, and a tetraploid octoploid contact zone. So uh, some more interesting work uh, at those uh, levels of, uh, of interactions uh, among different ploidy levels and, and interactions with, with plant and insects uh, and ploidy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording here in a moment, but I uh, want to thank Sonia and Joel again for uh, two wonderful talks. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to, to get to hear all these wonderful talks. I know my, my personally, I've, I've really enjoyed hearing these and I know in my lab as well, I'm sure that your students and postdocs and your labs uh, everyone else out there, is, uh, it's been a great chance to learn about polyploidy so far. Um, anybody that wants to uh, continue giving talks, uh, continue keeping this going in, this, in the fall, uh, please feel free to email me. We've already scheduled a couple more uh, on into September, and we'll keep mm -hmm. going uh, on this two-week cycle. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone.